Hi, my name is Dr. Ross Hauser. Thank you for watching. Coming to you live from the Hauser Next Center here in Fort Myers, Florida. This video is on one of the most important topics that I've ever covered, and that's how ligamentous cervical instability and changes in the neck structure affect a person's emotional stability and personality. And we'll have at least one uh, interview with one of the patients here at the Hauser Neck Center. But I've done other patient interviews of them sharing how their psychological diagnosis such as bipolar or personality disorders have been radically changed once for the better once they had their cervical structure optimized and their stability restored. So anyone who's had a change in emotional status or pers personality, who's had a sudden switch, you have to think like, why? Like, why would that happen? So what can happen literally overnight is that a person's brain pressure can get to a certain point where there are certain parts of the brain that aren't functioning correctly or they're not uh, their nerve impulses to other parts aren't occurring and they'll have a sudden change in emotional stability. Like for instance, they could have new onset anxiety. So if you know somebody whose personality has absolutely changed like almost overnight, more irritability or more, more lack of interest in things, um, they, they don't care about the future, um, all of a sudden they're very depressed or all of a sudden they have bipolar disorder or something, you have to think like, that's not right. Like, why would that be? How could you go from reasonable brain functioning to <laughs> non-reasonable? The most logical thing is there's something major going on in the neck. And very subtle changes in the neck structure can massively affect the brain and how the brain functions. So negative changes in personality and psychological status could be due to ligamentous cervical instability or cervical destructure. And by cervical destructure, it just means that there's a radical change in the cervical structure, like somebody's neck structure has been broken, which we call cervical destructure. And that disrupts fluid flow into and out of the brain or nerve impulses to and from the brain or within the brain. If you or the person who has had a personality or emotional status change has also clicking, popping, grinding in their neck, muscle tension, muscle spasm. You have to think that the personality change or new onset depression or anxiety, it's due to the neck. Other symptoms suggestive of intracranial hypertension are head pressure, headaches, blurred vision. Other symptoms suggested of vagus nerve degeneration, all these things can occur with cervical, ligamentous cervical instability and changes in the neck structure. Swallowing difficulty, increased stress, emotional lability, digestive problems. Symptoms of anhedonia, anhedonia like uh, somebody doesn't care, they have no pleasure in things. Uh, that's actually, to me, a kind of a common symptom. So anhedonia, apathy, not caring about the future. Uh, you could have a bubbly person who all of a sudden looks like somebody who's massively depressed. These are kind of signs that there's something going on in the brain, such as increased brain pressure. So if you have new onset or know somebody with new onset, lack of motivation, diminished pleasure derived from daily activity, social withdrawal, loss of libido, that's probably, it's related to the neck and the neck structure screwing up the brain. And this is happening in epidemic proportions to the teenagers. So if you have a teenager or even somebody who's in their 20s and they're living at home and they don't wanna plan for the future, they just as soon play video games. I had a person <laughs> say to me, like uh, the, the schools will diagnose like attention deficit, attention deficit disorder, but yet the person can play a video game for four hours. And I'm like, wow, I never thought about it that way. Like it's not a attention deficit disorder. They can play the video game for four hours and go up levels. Like it's not an attention problem. It's an addiction problem. 
It's an addiction problem. So the more you're addicted to the cell phone and the more people are like that, it's an addiction problem. So the person just wants to do that. They want to do gaming or look at their cell phone and they don't want to do school work, for instance. And the problem is you can, you can damage the brain. You can damage the brain because of a broken neck structure. And I'll show you like some of the research about this. So this just shows that uh, these are signs on MRI that there's a problem. Like, so people who have personality changes, often they'll get an MRI of the neck or the brain. So here you see the dens here is going back. That's abnormal. That's a sign that a person has upper cervical instability. You could see here the, the cerebellar tonsils are within the hole, the foramen magnum, which is that hole. That's a sign. There's a breakdown of the neck structure here, and you're starting to see pooling of the cerebral spinal fluid. And ultimately what ends up happening is toxins build up in the brain, and those toxins along with the increased pressure can start damaging the brain or having the brain not function correctly. And it's manifested by apathy, personality changes, not caring about the future. So what happens with cell phone addiction, gaming, looking down continuous at the cell phone, not being outside, you have a breakdown of the neck curve and all these things happen. So the fluid flow into and out of the brain gets affected. The cerebral spinal fluid gets static, reduced blood flow. You get compression of the jugular vein, so the brain pressure goes up and ultimately, the brain tissue dies. And when the brain tissue dies, man, bad, bad things happen to the person. I just have this up here to show that many, many uh, brain conditions, intracranial hypertension, stroke, uh, hemorrhage, Chiari, it's notorious to have all kinds of personality changes. So anything that's gonna affect the brain, for instance, the brain pressure like this does, you're gonna have all kinds of personality changes along with other symptoms. And a common symptom that people get is they get memory or concentration or foggy thinking. From a workup standpoint, often people with personality changes will have a brain MRI and these are symptoms that are suggestive for intracranial hypertension. So if you said to me, what actually doc causes a change in personality, a change in the ability to handle stress, a change in the emotional status that can be from the neck. It would be that it's obstructing the jugular vein so the brain pressure goes up. These are all signs of the brain pressure going up. Zigzaggy optic nerve, flattening of the globe, the eye. You see all this cerebral spinal fluid here. The dens is going back. You see an the pituitary gland is getting atrophied, which has to do with the hormones. And again, what happens is because the jugular vein gets compressed, the pressure builds up in the brain. Unfortunately, it builds up in places in the brain like the frontal lobe and the anterior cingulate cortex, which are involved with problem solving. Also taking our emotional memories and handling them the correct way. But if you injure the frontal lobe or you injure the anterior cingulate cortex, what happens is emotional things take over where there's not that break, if you will, you know, that break, if you will. Uh, so you handle yourself in the right way, then there's emotional liability. And this is just all the different things that happen with intracranial hypertension. It can ultimately lead to irreversible brain damage. So I normally see people when they have a lot of different things going on, but one of the most common things they have is they'll say, Doc, I'm just telling you, man, some, I don't feel like myself. That's a real common one. I just don't feel like myself. Like, I, like I'm not myself. So what they're saying is like the brain is disconnected to the rest of the body. They don't feel like themselves, depersonalization. They don't have any hope for the future. So then they get apathy. They have anhedonia where 
they have a lack of pleasure, especially the kids. They come in here sometimes, like when you see the movies, like the zombies, for lack of a better term, where there's not a facial expression. Of course, I'm seeing them when the thing's gone on for two or three years. But if you have a young person or you yourself, this has happened where you just have trouble laughing anymore, this process is probably going on in you. That you're getting accelerated brain death, you need to get tests for brain pressure, you need to get your optic nerve sheath diameters checked and other things, and especially a fluid flow into and out of the brain. So this is a normal optic nerve sheath. That's one that's like twice the size. That's a sign of intracranial hypertension that the brain pressure is too high. That's the silent killer of the brain. And when the brain pressure is high, there's a lot of fluid around the eye nerve, and that's why you can get vision changes. This is Karina, our ultrasound tech, you know, looking at the eye nerve, so you can see it there. And then when the when there's breakdown of the cervical curve or instability of the upper cervical region, you get blockage or compression of the jugular vein, which causes fluid to accumulate inside the brain. It can damage the frontal lobe or the anterior cingulate cortex. And those things have to do with higher cognitive functioning. For you and I to make a good decision, to be even keeled, you have to have a normal frontal lobe and a normal anterior cingulate cortex because those things are gonna be the stops, if you will, from being like an animal. The problem is that the frontal lobe can inhibit the, every emotional thing or everything a person thinks of. You're gonna be instinctual like an animal, and that's what we see in a lot of the young people or people that have had massive personality changes. So the progression of increased brain pressure. So the person has normal brain pressure. They're sharp, they're amazing. They have a small increase in pressure. They have brain fog. They feel dumber like as the day goes on. When it gets more severe, it can become impossible to work and normal chores become difficult. Eventually they have massive personality changes. They can go to the extremes of rage, anxiety, then to the other extreme of depression and just apathy. I have a patient who's an academic advisor in a high school and it's at a pretty prominent school in the area. And I, I said, what's the main struggle that the teenagers have? And she said, cell phone. I go, what do you mean? She said, they're all addicted. She said 100% of the students in uh, this public high school that has a good reputation, they're addicted. I go, how do you know? She said, when they come in for academic advising, I look at their cell phone and every single one, the amount of screen time is between 10 and 14 hours. This stuff is happening in all the kids you know, that have a cell phone. So if your kid is out of control, they're not of their sound mind, first thing you have to do is severely limit it, or I would even advise take the cell phone away. It's unbelievable when a kid's out of control and you get rid of the cell phone for two weeks, it's like their mind gets back to normal. So every time you look at a cell phone, that takes metabolic energy of the brain. That means those cells are basically producing waste products. So can you imagine the amount of waste products that the human brain are making compared to 50 years ago before or 30 years ago before the cell phone? It's got to be enormous. And then while that's happening, the drainage of the brain's going down because of jugular vein compression, because of the breakdown of the cervical curve. So it's no wonder the kids are just struggling. Depression, suicide. Last weekend, I was at Golisano Children's Hospital here because there was a young person that I knew that had tried to commit suicide. I mean, he was close to being successful. He needed a, you know, a teenager that's 14, right? Personality change, not making rational decisions, right? So the kids need to be reading. They need to be off of their cell phones. They need to be outside. They need to be playing sports. They need to have interaction with, uh, with uh, human beings instead of the instead of the phone. So these are all known neurologic and psychiatric symptoms that occur with increased brain pressure. Look at all these things, anxiety, aggression, binge eating, depersonalization. And I could just say that more and more patients are coming to the Hauser Neck Center with personality changes is the thing that's worrying them the most. So 
the treatment of it is it goes back to why is the brain pressure going up? So the brain pressure typically is going up because there's a breakdown of the cervical curve. There's obstruction of the jugular vein. We do ultrasound exams of the jugular vein to see uh, what position opens it up. So we get the person in that position. And of course, when they have neck instability, we um, you know, do prolotherapy to tighten and strengthen the ligaments. But a lot of it is a person has to, when they have this and are trying to get better, I say to them, you should make it your full-time job of getting your neck curve and you have got to try to get off of the internet. So I haven't yet had it, but I've been thinking about giving people the prescription of an internet fast. So if you're struggling with your brain, I'm just telling you, do an internet fast. Do an internet fast, like start whole days and, and weeks without being on the internet and just see what happens to your brain function. Because remember, every time you have to make a decision on the internet, like you're clicking here, clicking there, that takes energy. And obviously a brain that's struggling, a brain that's tired, a brain that's toxic, you mainly need good sleep, so what we do in the office is we figure out what position of sleep is optimal to open up the jugular veins. I'll give you an example. So say you're struggling with this and you always sleep in a cer certain position, sleep in the opposite position. And the positions that we find the most helpful is to sleep, well here I'll just do it this way, sleep but look at the back wall, look at the back wall, like try to induce the curve, try to induce the curve, so don't sleep crinkled up like this, that tends to obstruct the jugular vein. We're looking back, that opens up the jugular vein. And when the jugular vein starts uh, draining, especially with sleep, then the brain pressure goes down. And it takes some time for the brain to regenerate. But with, they found that the brain can regenerate into the 90s. And when the brain starts regenerating, of course, the person starts smiling again. They, get, they have goals, their personality gets back to normal, and that's all we all want. Hi, my name is Dr. Ross Hauser. Welcome to the Hauser Next Center. I'm here with just a very uh, wonderful young lady, Morgan Griffiths, who we've known each other for 18 months. And uh, Morgan, now you're actually still in the process of care here at Caring Medical. So you're a good example of, you know, we didn't resolve the issue, you know, in a, in a short period of time, and it's been quite a journey for you. Yeah. And um, you know, I only meet people realistically after they're sick, you know, so yeah. I've never known like, you know, the the Morgan Griffith that existed prior to you having uh, cervical instability. So I was hopeful you could let us know like how your life was before your neck started to bother you and what changes you notice, especially in your personality after your injury. Yeah, it was like there was a huge shift overnight and like I I really didn't recognize myself anymore and it was before I knew it was coming from my neck but I just knew that like something big happened and so the old me what I think of it as is I used to be like go 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 constantly and I was always the person that was like I'm willing to do everything all the time and always like lead conversations and super engaged in conversations and like I saw myself as a really good friend. Like I always wanted to do everything for everyone else. And then like overnight, I just remember sitting and just thinking like nothing changed, but I am so sad. Like, and then I realized I'm pretty depressed. And then following that, I was super, super anxious. And like just thing after thing, I, I didn't want to, I didn't want to be around anyone anymore. And following the sadness came like a lot of rage and it's like I used to enjoy everyone's presence and just I used to be just generally really happy with everything mm -hmm. and then it's like someone could just barely speak and the noise of their voice like I just like was shaking with rage and just like I actually just had to like yell like I, I just felt like I just needed to scream mm -hmm. and that would come with like someone speaking or just like someone in the kitchen, like just like it, it made it so hard to 
live with people and at the time I did live with people and I had to move and then even after that like just living even around my family became really really hard and I didn't recognize myself anymore and it was scary. What year was that? Were you in college or was that after college? I was in grad school. Oh you were? Yeah. Okay. So it was like a big shift from undergrad where everything was always really fun and I wanted to be around all my peers to like just suddenly one day I was trying to go to class and I the someone speaking next to me I was like just so on edge with someone just talking normally and then I couldn't sit up in class anymore I couldn't listen I was leaving class early because I just couldn't be there and then slowly or not slowly very quickly I just couldn't be around anyone or I didn't even have the desire to do anything I also my life used to revolve around athletics like 100 percent and I couldn't work out anymore like that was a very quick change that was really hard to accept if I tried to work out like the rage came again like my head was going to explode and I was just so mad and it was after just like a minute or two of trying to do anything he uh, did you did you have to drop out of the um you yeah. the grad school program. Yeah, I did. I was really trying to push through at first, and then I feel like one day I was just talking to my boyfriend, and I was just like, I can't do anything anymore. And and that's really, like, I didn't even accept it at the time, but that's just what I had to do. Like, I could not do anything. Like, like I couldn't drive anywhere. I couldn't go to class. I I just felt like I could do nothing but lay in bed. Did you cry a lot or no? A lot. Yeah, that's what I All think. the time. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Even if I didn't know why I was crying, I was crying all the time. Right. And I couldn't hold conversations with people anymore, which was really strange to me because I, I was always like the conversation leader and I always wanted people to feel like good around me, you know, and then I felt yeah. like I couldn't be around anyone because I couldn't engage. And then you were on a major university track team, so you know you were a yeah. uh, major university track team, and then you even were a decathlete, right? Yeah. And yeah. that's not easy to train for 10 sports, so you went from training for 10 sports, so that would be almost like a full-time job, but that was kind of mm -hmm. your joy too. Yeah, yeah, I absolutely loved it, and so, I hit a point where I didn't know what else to do. Like, mm -hmm. if I couldn't work out, like, what could I do? And all, all I felt like I could do was lay in bed. And if I tried to get up, it was just, I didn't feel like I could really do anything anyways. The, uh, so, I, you know, you've been on a journey, you know, you know, with Caring Medical with me for the last year and a half. What are yeah. some things that you've learned or what's gone on with your life in the last year and a half? Like I what's learned, the good thing and what's maybe the bad thing? Yeah, well, I feel like those things are just kind of combined, you know. There's a lot of things that I felt like were bad at first, but I've like seen the other side of them with the help of you a lot. Like letting go of a lot of things and it, just accepting that this is a time in my life where I'm focusing on my health and my personality is changing, but it's not necessarily bad anymore. Like I'm able to accept that life is a little bit slower now, and now like I'm so thankful to be at a point where I'm adding things back in now, and like I'm able to be around people at a slower pace, and I'm finding joy in that again. And even if I don't feel like my brain is working as quickly as it used to, you know, maybe that's not such a bad thing. Like, I feel like I'm able to be more in the moment and appreciate things more now and appreciate the small things that I do get to do through the day. And if I have a really good day, I'm really grateful for that. So, I mean, I used to feel super down about letting go of grad school and letting go of track, but on the bright side, I've learned like how to reconnect with people and like even on a deeper level and how to 
just really enjoy the smaller things throughout the day. And then Paolo, he's been with you the whole time. Huh? Yeah, I can't say that I know if I would have made it through without him. Yeah. Yeah, he's been a great support. Paul is my boyfriend, and when I had to drop out of grad school, he was there for me, and he has been there for me the whole time mm -hmm. and supported if I need to lay in bed all day, then he is just there to help me with whatever I need. And on the days that are good, he's there to be grateful with me. And yeah, he's been really great. It's kind of like through your journey, though, you found faith again, like faith in God, right? Absolutely. That, so tell us a little bit about that. Yeah, actually Fort Myers has been a big part of that. Mm -hmm. Of course you have been a big part of that, but even outside of the office, like sometimes I'll just be walking around Fort Myers and someone will just stop and it's like, just feel like they need to talk to me and it's it's like nothing I've ever experienced before <laughs> like I'm just like how how did you know that you need to say this right now and it's really been crazy but yeah I I have felt like God's love through other people especially in Fort Myers just more so than I've ever felt in my entire life and it's really restored my faith and helped me find peace and calmness even through the worst days for sure awesome yeah it's just amazing getting to know you so i've appreciated your friendship and i know you I like you like you tell me like every you tell everybody about prolotherapy so yeah i do i do i really believe in it so. even though i'm not 100 percent yet mm -hmm. i i can feel that it's helping me a lot thank you for sharing your story I th Thanks. I'm sure it's going to help a lot of people. Thanks for listening.